Dale McGowan is a writer, editor, and critical thinking advocate. His satirical novel, Quality of Bernadette's Bluff, has been called an undoubted triumph of satire and wicked funny. Dale hosts the West Metro chapter of the Critical Thinking Club and is the U.S. Communications Direct, excuse me, U.S. Communications Coordinator for Nonviolent Peace Force, a global civilian peacekeeping organization. His most recent book is Parenting Beyond Belief, on amazing ethical, caring kids without a religion. The first comprehensive book of its kind and the topic of this presentation today. This is the third and most likely final presentation for Minnesota Atheists as he and his family are moving to Atlanta in July. And this is uh, Dale McGowan. Dale. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I assume the mic is on? Unless I hear otherwise? Okay. Uh, my daughter Delaney came to me at the age of four and announced that she had finally figured out, as she put it, the God and Jesus thing. She'd heard about these guys in her, Lethra, uh, her uh, Lutheran preschool class. Shut up, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but they never explained exactly what their deal was, so she crafted her own theology to fill in the gaps. She had decided that Jesus made all the good things in the world and that God made all the bad and scary things. <laughs> so puppies and PBS are from Jesus then, while tornadoes and Fox News are God's doing. <laughs> now, the next five words out of the mouths of many religious parents would be, no, 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 in that order, followed by a dose of theological castor oil to set the child straight. Very few would let the day end with their child still thinking that God might be the source of all evil. Some secular parents do a little better, though, when they say, no, 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 God is pretend. In the process, both parents substituted their authority for the child's autonomous thought. I've always preferred to praise the independent thought and let the child run like mad with it. It's good practice. Cool, I said to Delaney. I never thought of it like that. And sure enough, the next week, she promulgated a revised encyclical. God, she said, makes all the things for grown-ups, and Jesus makes all the things for kids. My favorite example, God made the deep end of the pool and Jesus made the shallow end for her. <laughs> I gave her a hug and said, so God for me and Jesus for you, eh? I guess so, she said. I'm not sure, I'm still thinking about it. Now she's parroting one of my mantras there, the need to keep thinking, to never close oneself off to further information. And that doesn't mean rolling up in a quivering ball of agnosticism, by the way. I also make it clear to them that it's okay to say what you think is true. And earlier this year on the way home from school, she told me about a chat she had that day with Mrs. W, her teacher at the Lutheran preschool. I told Mrs. W I think God is just pretend, she told me. But I said I'm still thinking about it, and I asked her if she thinks God is pretend. And I looked at Laney in the rearview mirror, munching on the apple that I'd remembered for once to bring for her snack so beautifully innocent of the fact that she had stood with her little toes at the edge of an age-old chasm, shouting a courageous and ancient question to her teacher on the far rim. My daughter, you see, hasn't heard that there are unaskable questions. So what did Mrs. W say? I asked. She said no, Laney said matter-of-factly. She said, I think God is very real. Uh-huh, and then what did you say, Lane? I said, that's okay as long as you're still thinking about it, too. Uh. <laughs> Two years later, remembering that sentence still brings a catch to my throat. That's okay, she said, because it would never occur to her that we all have to believe the same. 
And then the caveat against the closed process. Now, how many people of religious faith ever hear that their faith is okay only if it remains open to disconfirmation? How many? Whatever that number is, if I can keep my kids blissfully ignorant of the rules, it will increase. My other two kids went to the same preschool. It's a great program, which is why we go there, the best in our area, but I wondered at the beginning if I was going to regret enrolling our kids in a church-affiliated school. By the end of my son's first year, I was convinced it was one of the best decisions we could have made. My kids have received a basic, low-key, brimstone-free exposure to Judeo-Christian mythology, an essential element of cultural literacy, and early practice at engaging that world with the brutal honesty of fearless innocence. All I ask of my kids' early exposures to religion is that they are never abused with the concept of hell and that they are never told that doubt is bad. And so far, so good. Now, these various experiences, the fearless questioning, the low-key religious exposure, they began to strike me as genuinely useful insights into secular parenting. And though I've been an atheist for about 25 years, I've only been a parent for 12. And it's the combination that has yielded the insights. Five years ago, I stumbled across the Family Issues page of the Atheist Alliance Web Center. They were in search of a volunteer editor. I figured, why not? I'd offer my insights and gather the insights of others. I planned a series of reviews of books on parenting without religion, plans that were quickly canceled when I couldn't find a single one. And I should say, though I couldn't find them, there actually were two small books on the topic, Ann Stone's Living in the Light and Jane Wynne Wilson's Parenting Without God. But they were so well hidden that even carefully looking, I couldn't find them. Ann's excellent book was published by American Atheist Press, and Jane's was published by Educational Heretics and released only in the UK. So I began to think about writing one myself. And several problems surfaced right away. My kids were quite young, so we hadn't really dealt with the major secular parenting issues yet. Problem number two, since my novel had been self-published, I had neither an agent nor a publisher. Problem number three, I was unlikely to attract an agent or a publisher since I was an obscure professor in an unrelated field at a small college. I tried anyway, proposing a secular parenting book to 30 agents and 20 publishers over the course of a year. And they quickly added a fourth problem to my list. There is no market for such a book, they said. The proof they gave, if there were a market, there would already be books for it. <laughs> the absence of books proves the absence of a market, which in turn stops books from being produced, which okay, the sharper minds in the crowd may detect some circularity there. <laughs> now, I could have gone to Prometheus. They have dedicated themselves to serving our specialized market. But I wanted to demonstrate that there was a mainstream market for such a book beyond the self-identified free thought world. If you broaden to include the weakly self-identified, we've got 14.1% of the population, 40 million people. That's between 7 and 10 million parents. There is a book on the bookshelves today called Beekeeping for Dummies. I'd love to see the proposal for that one. It's not even for all beekeepers, just the dumb ones. They just released another one called Logic for Dummies. I'm not kidding, that's this year. And then there's Mormonism for dummies. Well, there's a deep market for you. <laughs> so anyway, there seem to be books for every imaginable slice of the population but ours. So I set the project aside. In the meantime, Dawkins and Harris showed decisively, one would think, that a mainstream free thought market exists, both of them hitting number four on the New York Times list, if I recall correctly. And during this time, I was writing the sequel to my novel, and then I wrote a death-obsessed, humorous, secular travel narrative. And that one, amazingly, finally snagged an agent. While he tried to sell that book, I told him about this old idea I had of a book on parenting without religion. And I said I could probably get Richard Dawkins, Penn Jillette, and Julia Sweeney to contribute to it. And Mark Twain. <laughs> From his reaction, I don't think he even believed I could get Twain. I had no reason for confidence myself except the belief that the project would strike these people as long overdue and too good to pass up. So I sent an email to Julia Sweeney and she said yes in 90 minutes. And I knew I was onto something. But I showed an unfortunate talent after that for contacting people at the worst possible times. My request hit Richard's desk the very day that his documentary, The Root of All Evil, aired in Britain. It was good timing. Imagine his inbox on that day. I contacted Penn the first week of his daily radio show that went on the air um, early this year, 
while he was doing eight live shows a week in Vegas with Teller and rapping the season of bullshit. While I waited for the two of them to get back to me, I started rounding out the topics and the contributor list. By six weeks after my message to Julia, I had asked 28 people to contribute, and 25 of them said yes. I pulled together a killer proposal with the list of contributors and sent it to my agent who started shopping it around, and one publisher after another said, there's no market. <coughs> Finally, after about four weeks, we got a contract from Amicom Books. Amicom is primarily a business press, but it also has a parenting line among others, and it's huge, and it's mainstream, and it's on Broadway in the heart of New York publishing. And then the fun began. I won't bore you with too many details of herding these 25 cats, other than to say that it was the most complex thing I will ever willingly do. I did learn a great deal about editing. I learned that when you ask a writer to give you 2,000 words on a given topic, they will generally give you 3,000 to 6,000 words on the topic of their choice, especially if they're free thinkers. <laughs> Stu, by the way, was a notable exception. I should say that right away. Um, other things I learned. I learned how to enrage Penn Jillette. The answer is change one word in an 1,100 word essay. I also managed by the skin of my teeth to avoid making our book the world's first parenting book with the phrase, butt-reaming asshole in the first paragraph. <laughs> I should give a little context. <laughs> uh, Michael Shermer wrote the foreword, and in the foreword, in the first paragraph, he quotes uh, the scene from Parenthood, where Keanu Reeves' character says that you need a license to fish, you need a license to drive a car, but any butt-reaming asshole can be a father. And it's a great thing coming from Keanu Reeves <laughs> in the context of the movie, but I somehow felt in a parenting way. Uh, a central premise of the book is an acknowledgement that religion has much to offer parents. An established community, a predefined set of values, a common lexicon and symbology, rites of passage, a means of engendering wonder, comforting answers to the big questions, and consoling explanations to ease experiences of hardship and loss. But for most secularists, these benefits come at way too high a price. Intellectual integrity is compromised, the word values is often turned on its head, and us and them mentality too often reinforced. Religious answers are found unconvincing, yet held unquestionable. And so in seeking the best for our children, we try to chart a path around the church and end up doing so without a compass. The purpose of parenting beyond belief is to demonstrate the many ways in which the undeniable benefits of religion can be had without the detriments, and to show ways in which secular parenting, frankly, leaves religious parenting in the dust. The book is organized into nine chapters, personal reflections, living with religion, holidays and celebrations on being and doing good, values and virtues, meaning and purpose, death and consolation, wondering and questioning, mind-buzzing, jaw-dropping science, and seeking community. There's an essay by psychologi psychologist Jean Mercer on how moral development actually occurs. Turns out it has nothing to do with stone tablets by Julia Sweeney on her uncertain grapplings with the religious influences around her adopted daughter, Richard Dawkins' open letter to his daughter Juliet on good and bad reasons for believing, Penn Jillette on being a new secular father, philosopher Gareth Matthews on talking to children about evil, Don Ardell on secular meaning and purpose, Pete Wernick on the mixed marriage, Tom Flynn and yours truly facing off on the Santa Claus question, Stu Tanquist on choosing your battles, Margaret Downey, Dan Barker, Annie Laurie Gaylor, and many more. Though opinions and emphases vary, a real consensus emerged on many of the basic challenges, principles, and joys of parenting without religion. Here are some of the challenges. Helping kids to be free thinkers in a world that stigmatizes and fears religious doubt. Teaching kids and ourselves to have empathy for people who are still stuck in religious mythology. Being honest about our own opinions and values without indoctrinating our kids. And the relative lack of infrastructure and resources for secular families. Now notice that both death and morality, which are always assumed to be the real corkers for secular parents, are missing from the list of particular challenges. These are discussed in great detail in the book, but you never get the sense that these are more challenging for secular parents than they are for religious ones, because they're really not. The challenges are just different. There's also a fair consensus that we overestimate the power of religion to seduce our children. To the contrary, if you think about it, religion requires a tremendous amount of propping up and special effects to take root. All we have to do is withhold the props and it falls over under the weight of its own absurdities. Now think about that. It's amazing. 
Christianity offers release from our single greatest human terror, death, for the mere cost of an uttered sentence. Yet it's such an untenable collection of crap that they have to back up the free gift with the threat of eternal combustion if you refuse it. Penn Jillette said it best in his essay called Passing Down the Joy of Not Collecting Stamps. You don't have to worry too much about your kids. You don't ever have to teach atheism. You don't have to teach an absence of guilt for things they didn't do. As atheist parents, you just have one more reason to keep your kids away from priests. <laughs> the publisher begged me to take that sentence out. <laughs> one of many tussles. Tell your kids the truth as you see it and let the marketplace of ideas work as they grow up. I don't know who said atheism is a religion like not collecting stamps is a hobby. Everybody knows that one? But some guy or gal said it, and it's a more important idea than any Jesuit ever came up with. You have to work hard to get kids to believe nonsense. If you're not desperately selling lies, the work is a lot easier. He's right, you know. We often have too little confidence in reason. I'm confident that if my kids develop a love of reality and the ability to think well, they will never run to religion. Now those first two steps, of course, are essential in that. So I put my energy there, not in fending off exposure to religion which gets to another perhaps surprising general agreement among the contributors, that our kids really have to be religiously literate. Exclusive exposure to a single religion leads to ignorant, blinkered thinking. But exposure to multiple religions reveals religion as a human cultural artifact and denies any one of them the high ground. The study of religion, as opposed to indoctrination into religion, aids our understanding of the religiously saturated world around us. It can also inoculate our kids against the more poisonous religious ideas. Here's the Unitarian Reverend Roberta Nelson, a humanist minister, in her essay. Choosing not to affiliate or join a religious community does not shield a parent from religious questions. If you do not provide the answers, someone else will, and you may be distressed by the answers they provide. I think it's a very important passage. I allow religious ideas and stories and claims to just wash over my kids from every direction, every direction, not a single one, and that's crucial. They hear about baby Jesus and baby Hercules in the same breath. Jehovah gets no more airtime than the everlasting Brahmin, and Jesus no more than Mithras. Skepticism is such a central value in our home that I don't have to watch and worry and screen out ideas. And there are two important exceptions. Two bits of intellectual terrorism that I will not permit my children to consider. The idea of hell and the related notion that doubt is bad. Both of these are designed to paralyze thinking. That's what they're for. So I won't allow the serious consideration of either in our home. My stomach just, my stomach just sank two weeks ago when my nine-year-old daughter Erin came home from school with the news that her three best friends all agree she's going to burn in hell. And I knelt before my girl to get the full story. Sweetie, what'd they say that for? Well, they were talking about church and stuff, she said. And they asked if I believe in God and go to church. And I said, no, I don't believe in God and I don't go to church. And then their eyes got really big and they said, oh, you're going to burn in hell. And I waited for the first teardrop to appear, which is always my sign to sprint to the bat cave. I said, uh, oh, I'm so sorry they said that, pumpkin. How did that make you feel? And instead of tears, she shrugged. It was pretty mean, she said, but also silly. And I looked at her in amazement. It is silly, of course, a profoundly stupid and childish idea, but how did she come to that so directly? It took me years and years to shift hell from terrifying to terrifying but unlikely to silly. And then I remembered, of course, she's been inoculated. If I had hidden the idea of hell from my daughter all these years, protecting her from the concept, the sudden invocation of the flames by her friends could have burned a fear into her that would take some serious undoing. But we've talked about religious ideas for years. I've always made my opinions clear, but I go to great lengths to let her know that other good people think differently. Dad, did Jesus really come alive after he was dead? And I say, I don't think he did, no. I think that's just a made-up story to make people feel better about death. But talk to Grandma Barbara. I know she thinks it really happened, and then you can make up your own mind, and even change your mind back and forth about a hundred times if you want. That's my usual approach. But hell is an exception. Hell gets no hearing from me. I will not allow my children to be terrorized by anyone with the sick fantasy of an afterlife of eternal punishment. 
especially one meted out for honest doubts. If ever there was a, a religious idea with human fingerprints all over it, hell is it. So I've always told my children that hell is not only fiction, it's also, that's right, she was using my exact word, silly. Even if there is a God, I've told them repeatedly, he's not going to care if you guess wrong about him. That sounds like a human king, not the all-wise creator of the universe. He might care about how good you are or even respect your honest doubts more than the dishonest belief of people who are just trying to avoid hell. But in any case, the idea that any God worth his salt would create a hell to punish his children is just silly. Just as we inoculate our kids against disease by putting small amounts of the bad stuff into their arms to build resistance, we have to inoculate them against toxic ideas that can paralyze their abilities to think freely. Specifically invite them through their... Specifically invite fearless doubt, and they can live without medieval ignorance and fear trailing them through their one and only life. Tell them about hell, and then don't just disagree with it. Laugh it to smithereens. Moral development is another important topic in the book, and Gene Mercer's piece does a marvelous job of walking us through Kohlberg's six sequential stages of moral development. Fear of punishment, hope of, re hope of reward, social approval and disapproval, the recognition of laws or rules as valuable in themselves, the social contract level, in which laws and rules are seen as desirable but potentially changeable, and the final stage, in which a person thinks in terms of universal ethical principles and is occasionally willing to defend such principles even at the risk of punishment or disapproval. Mercer notes that many adults do not appear to move beyond the second reward stage, um, and that the official morality, as she puts it, of the United States appears to be stuck somewhere between the law and order stage and the social contract stage. The consensus of contributors is that moral development is an understandable process and that kids can be consciously involved in their own moral development. That's an important thread in the book. The topic of dealing with death is handled wonderfully by Kendall Gibbons, perhaps the leading UU humanist in the United States. She's the minister at First Unitarian downtown. Uh, but death is also a prominent feature of six other essays in the collection. And the consensus on death among the contributors? We're all opposed to it. <laughs> but as for parenting, there's general agreement to never treat death as an untouchable subject. Touch it all over. The more familiar, the less frightening. It's a lifelong challenge. But our kids will be all the further along if they don't have to waste time erasing heaven and hell from their conceptual maps. And then there's the wonder thread. Humans need wonder. Fortunately, the wonder inherent in a scientific worldview utterly trumps the religious imagination, as you all may know. This is the focus of my own essay titled Teaching Kids to Yawn at Counterfeit Wonder, in which I compare the vague and colorless hyperbole of religious wonder. God is wonderful. No, no, really, really wonderful, really especially great and powerful to the revelatory wonder of science. If you condense the history of the universe to a single year, humans would appear on December 31st at 10.30 p.m. We are star material that knows it exists. Through the wonder of DNA, you are literally half your mom and half your dad. A complete blueprint to build you exists in each and every cell of your body. The faster you go, the slower time moves. Your memories, your knowledge, even your identity and sense of self exist entirely in the form of a constantly recomposed electrochemical symphony playing in your head. All life on Earth is directly related by descent. You are a cousin not just of apes, but of the sequoia and the amoeba of mosses and butterflies and blue whales. That's wonder. And there is surely no, way to st no surer way to strip religion of its ability to entice our children into fantasy than to show them the way step by step into the far more intoxicating wonders of the real world. Help kids fall madly in love with that incredible universe and they will never, ever again try to fit the round peg of supernatural religion into the square hole of reality. Now the reception to the book has been amazing. I was not prepared for that, frankly. I was prepared for howls of protest for both, from both sides. And there has been a little bit. For the most part, the reception has been great so far. Uh, some readers have been put off by religious critiques in some of the pieces, and they need to get over that. Um, as you'll see if you read the book, the critiques are extremely mild, and there's a good reason for this. The book is not intended to convert or convince. This is a book for us. It's for the millions and millions of us 
who have already found our way out of religion and simply want a little more help in raising our kids. But when I say it's for us, it's not only for the strongly self-identified. One of the main reasons I wanted to get a mainstream publisher is I want to break into that market out there. I want to break into that population that is silently disbelieving, which is larger than I think even the people in this room estimate. Some atheists might also find the book uh, um, too accommodating of religion. So uh, they will sometimes critique it on the other side, since it does encourage relig religious literacy and uh, religious coexistence, including the uh, work of two ministers as well, both humanists, but nonetheless. And I invite them to get over it as well. As long as ignorance, self-deception, and fear have a hold on some, some substantial portion of humanity, and they always will, religion in some form will be with us. Our task should be to break its monopoly on discourse and to raise children who can coexist with religion while insisting as loudly as possible that religionists make their practices less cancerous and more humane. Thanks very much. I'll bring Stu up here now. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I was honored when uh, Dale asked me to contribute to this book and uh, was excited to write the piece, and especially excited to have seen his editing. He's a fabulous editor and made me sound reasonable and intelligent. So I uh, made a small contribution. My, uh, my essay was titled Choosing Your Battles, and it's about, as a secular parent, how to deal with issues of church-state separation in the public school system. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, share a little bit about a couple of the issues um, that I talk about in the essay, and then we'll open this up for questions. I'll try to make this brief so we have plenty of time for that. Uh, I uh, come from a mixed marriage. I'm now divorced, but was married for 17 years to a Catholic, a devout Catholic. And we raised a daughter. Uh, my wife left when she was 15, uh, left me with the house, the kid, and the dog. So a pretty sweet deal. Uh, it, uh, one of the things that, that I often questioned was why is it that you know, Catholics won't seek out Jews or seek out Muslims and so forth? Why, I think I get that now. Why Catholics don't seek Catholics, Mormons don't seek Mormons, Jacks don't, or do seek cheerleaders. And I, I said that backwards. Why they, uh, um, but at any rate, I, I think I get it. Uh, and, and so in our household, things have changed a lot. I felt bad. There was this guy we've had there for about a decade uh, nailed to the wall over the sink. I uh, was finally able to uh, bring him down, let him rest in peace, uh, cleared the house of crucifixes, and, and things are very different now. One of the things that's different is uh, I, I made a rule for, for the house, two rules, which is really one rule, and that is always question authority. And rule number two, when in doubt, see rule number one. And uh, that's something that I've encouraged my daughter to do. It's not that I'm inviting anarchy. It's not that uh, it's an abdication of responsibility. Really, it's just saying that she has a right to question, and she's not going to get in trouble for questioning my, my decisions, my rationale. She should be able to hear something beyond, well, because I said so. And so that's an important rule in our house. The idea, of course, is that, uh, as Dale talked about, um, that, that she has a right to think for herself, come to her own conclusions, and that, of course, is, is what I would prefer. Well, in terms of choosing your battles, uh, I've had a couple challenges in the public school system that I'll share. The first had to do with the Pledge of Allegiance. And we had taken our daughter to uh, a parent-teacher conference. And at the conference, the, you know, things were going well, but her uh, teacher, homeroom teacher, uh, shared with us, that, did you know that your daughter doesn't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance? But no, I, I didn't know that. And, uh, but I asked him, well, why is that important? He you know, said, well, it's not important. I just thought you'd want to know. And I said, well, if it's not important, why did, you, why did you bring it up? It must be important. And boy, that guy squirmed so hard, it, it looked like it hurt. Um, and, and that's an example. When I talk about choosing your battles, that's an example where I don't think that needed to go any further. It was clear to him that, that I didn't care, and he also knew he was on shaky ground because legally she's not required to stand up, she's not required to participate, and, and frankly, uh, it's, it's troubling that he thought that was an issue. Uh, and so, so there was an issue resolved on the spot and we were able to move on from there and talk about things that were really important, like my daughter's grades, academic pro, uh, progress, and so forth. There was another issue that was more challenging, more troubling, at the start of her 10th grade, going into high school, 
uh, I went to the, the orientation session where different teachers talked about what they were going to be covering. And her health teacher got up and talked a lot about abstinence. In fact, it seemed like he couldn't not talk about abstinence. It was abstinence, 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 which is hard to say a lot in a row. Uh, but, but he just went on and on. It was as though he wanted to make it really clear there's no danger that these kids are going to learn anything about safe sex. And it didn't seem to trouble any of the parents. And I put my hand up and I asked, well, is there going to be any, like, uh, uh, anything about birth control? And he said, oh, yeah, there's a video for that. Uh, but, but we had all these speakers coming in for abstinence. And, and he had noted he wasn't able to find anybody from the other side, as he called it. So it was, uh, it, it was going to pretty much be a, a, a health class with that focus. Well, I chose not to pick that battle. And today I might, um, had a, if I were faced with that. Um, but let that go. Well, later in the course, my daughter started bringing home values assessments. And these were assessments that were intended to, to where she would rate herself and answer a bunch of questions. And um, depending on how she answered those questions, it would indicate whether she had issues, challenges with her ethics, her morals, her values, her assets. Uh, and, and I looked at the questions and it was very much of it was religiously focused. And I have uh, some examples of some of the questions that she had to answer in order to rate her morals, ethics, and so forth. One of the questions was, I attend weekly religious services. I've taught Sunday school or have otherwise taken an active part in my church. I believe in a supreme being. Each day I try to set aside time for worship. I read the Bible or other religious writings regularly. I believe in the power of prayer and meditation, and so forth and so forth. This is from a public school, and, and this really caught my attention. And of course, she was getting a low value score um, because of these different assessments. So I asked for some help with this. Rather than take this on myself, I thought it was too big, really, for me. I might be able to, and probably could, uh, get the teacher to stop giving these assessments, but maybe just for that semester. Uh, and I thought this was an important issue that had to be dealt with. And so I worked through the uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation. They wrote a letter on our behalf, uh, which went to the principal and the superintendent. The principal waffled for a while, and, and uh, they uh, didn't seem to want to deal with it, but ultimately did, hopefully, permanently. Uh, but there's an example of um, taking that to a much bigger step. I think ideally, when dealing with uh, issues of church-state separation, it would be great if we could talk to the teacher one-on-one. -on -one. And, and you know, really just to have that conversation help them to try to understand that, of course, isn't always an option, maybe not always the best approach. Sometimes it's nice to get things in writing. Sometimes things are just too big or, or aren't likely to be resolved. The, the key thing I think that's important to remember is that the, the goal is really to resolve this issue for your child and for other children, not to make the veins of uh, various adults' foreheads stand out. So, so anyway, the, the idea of uh, trying to, to really evaluate the issue, how big is it, uh, asking the child um, how they feel about it. My daughter was excited. She, was, she really wanted this to be addressed, and she loved it. Every time we'd get a letter from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, she wanted a copy, and she'd show it to her friends and so forth. So it was a, a very positive experience, and I think a good learning experience for her as well. Well, I wrap up the, my essay by just reminding people about that rule in our home. Always question authority when in doubt. See rule number one. And I think that applies equally well uh, to children and adults. With that, I think I'll turn this back over to Dale to wrap it up, and then we'll uh, go into a question and answer. Well, actually, I think we can go straight into questions, if you want to do that, uh, for me or for Stu. Yes, sir. Stu, what school was that in what city? Uh, Burnsville High School in Burnsville, Minnesota. Yeah. I have a question. If uh, my experience as a parent has strengthened my non-belief or disbelief, my atheism, and it's because I've learned as a parent one of the things you want for your kid or kids is to exceed you live longer than you, to be smarter than you, and the gods that people have uh, invented never want that. They seem to be lousy parents. Has anybody made that observation, or have you shared that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, 
I'm always hard pressed to say anything better than Dawkins or Harris. It's, <laughs> I've, I've realized that recently I've been quoting them an awful lot, uh, but I think it's Dawkins who uh, uh, framed religion as a limiter. You know, that it, it's not something that uh, frees you. That when you see it from the outside, you can realize that it, it serves the purpose of placing limits. Um, and certainly in terms of, you know, God as a, as a father figure, it's, it's appalling. It's absolutely, you know, sort of indisputably appalling if you... Uh, the, the extremely fortunate thing for most religious people, I think, is that they haven't read the book in which that's really laid out. Um, but I've read the book. So, uh, and I, that's another thing, I want my kids to read the Bible. I think it's one thing I say wherever I go, when I speak to Unitarians, when I speak, you know, I speak to Unitarians all over the place, whenever I'm speaking to a group, I say, please read your Bible. Please just read Genesis. If it seems too daunting, read just Genesis and skip the begats. I give my permission to skip the begats. And you will be awakened, you know, by that. And I think that's one of the many things is the, the uh, family values. And it's not just the Old Testament, as you know. It's the new as well. the central purpose of the book. The book, I, I think um, declared atheists, secular humanists, whatever, um, are going to get an awful lot out of the book. But that was my secondary audience from the beginning. Those folks are the ones that I wrote, the, that I put the entire book together for and that I had in mind during the editing process. I have so many friends who are doing that, who are torn up about it, who really don't like it. They're not even indifferent about it. They do not like it but they, want, they feel like they somehow just really have to, you know, how else are my kids going to learn about religion? Well, there are a thousand other ways. How else are they going to, you know, sort of, are they going to be marginalized, you know, by others uh, for this? Uh, there are some downsides. There are some risks. It's worth it, and it's doable. And so my, my answer would be that really um, that theme is woven into every page. That's the intention is to finally make people realize that it's okay to not do that. You don't have to do that. Did you want to address that one at all? Or? No. Okay. Others? Uh, you mentioned you're a professor at a small college. Were you engaged in which college? I was. Um, I was at the College of St. Catherine for 15 years, and I uh, had a split load. I taught half of my courses in music, music theory and music education, uh, music history. <laughs> I don't even know what I taught now. Um, and the other half was in the core curriculum, teaching an interdisciplinary seminar in writing and critical thinking. And it was, um, that's a long story in and of itself, but it was teaching critical thinking at a Catholic college for 10 years that eventually caused me to sort of publicly uh, challenge the college and then eventually leave last year. Yeah. Did you make Penn Gillette pen this 11,000 words down to 2,000 requested? Down to... Oh, no, his, his was 1,100. 1100. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the Pendulette thing. It was 1,100, so it was within, his was within the, the limit perfectly well. Um, what Penn had done, it's a brilliant essay. It's really a wonderful, uh, entertaining and informative essay. Um, he had used a, um, what I consider to be a really unnecessary offensive slur against uh, Christians. And I had actually asked all of the contributors in the guidelines to avoid that because it's just not the kind of book. You know, it's not a matter of being fearful or whatever, but I did not want to go through the review circuit and have every reviewer talking about that one word. This has happened to Richard Dawkins. How many reviews have you seen of The God Delusion that didn't have the word faith head in them? They all pull out that one word and give an impression of the book that's entirely incorrect. Uh, he used the word twice, and uh, one of the times it was completely playful, and in a paragraph where he was poking fun at atheists as well. Um, so I didn't want to get into that uh, trap. The word that uh, Penn had used is, I don't even know if I pronounce it right, uh, Christards. It's a combination of Christians and retards. 
um, and tons of fun in private, but um, the sentence actually worked perfectly well by simply taking the word out. Because he said, um, I don't have, we don't have any friends who are Christards or into any faith-based hooey. So I just said, we don't have any friends who are into any faith-based hooey. It's plenty fine. He was furious. He was absolutely furious, and he almost pulled the piece. So uh, uh, he's a busy man. He didn't read the guidelines. Uh, he, the one issue I have is that after the book came out, he has attacked it and said, don't buy it. You know, they completely gutted my piece, is what he said. Uh, so there you have it. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> but in a way, that is actually fine. It's helped me to position the book as a, a reasonable voice. You know, I'm, I'm actually uh, trying to uh, reach people and communicate. It still is, is, has plenty of spine, believe me. Uh, but I know where to draw the line. And I think that's a good thing to communicate. So he's actually helped me in a way that I'm sure would irritate him. Yeah. Um, to some extent, books aimed at um, reading and kids, um, you know, I guess that's your passion. There are books that really do that, and that's the Christian faith and child development. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And where people would, you know, there seems to be some discomfort in some of that later. And I, and I realized it was because people don't want another, you know, some of the religious people don't want another avenue to learn about that. So we them out, out in the home first. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's, there's other issues you have to develop later, but, you know, it's really so easy to do it, like you say, well, like so much, <coughs> without the, the religious part of it takes so much energy, like you say, to prop it up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I actually told a, uh, a reporter that uh, something very similar to what you just said, and I immediately regretted it, and fortunately she didn't put it in the piece. Um, but uh, I said, there is a very real way in which parts of this book could have been a few sentences long, and then the rest word scrambles and sudokus or something like that. Um, and I thought, <laughs> afterwards I thought, don't say that. But it's true, there are some places where all the book really needs to do is say, yes, you can raise moral children without religion. Just, just do that, you know? It's actually that the moral thing gets me more than anything because religious parents will look me in the eye and say, how in the world do you do this without the Ten Commandments or without God or whatever? And I, I just say precisely the same way you do. I've never met a religious parent who wasn't able to explain to a child why something was wrong. They all do it, and then they add, and God doesn't want us to do that. That's not central, that's a coda, right? You know, that's the appendix of the, of the thing. Um, so, with, with, uh, burning a cow really isn't very effective anyway. Oh, no, 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 oh, right. No, yeah, heaven and hell are greatly overrated as motivators. I think that's, that's really true. I've heard that from Christian friends. That's not what the motivation is. Not making the baby Jesus cry. I have heard that that was a big one for a lot when they were... Yeah, you have heard that one? You know, when Billy lies, he makes the baby Jesus cry. Um, you know, how about you make mom and dad cry, you know? It's, so, but the, the other important thing that you said is um, there are a lot of secular parenting books. There are lots. What this is is a secular parenting book. Right? So there are lots that don't have religion. What this one is specifically confined to uh, is the issues that come up related to religion and not participating in it. Right. So it, yeah. Right, and those aren't addressed in these other books. Exactly right. Yeah. And you know, this, you know, when everyone else is talking about like, people from their church and they keep condoning people at other events, and, you know, and you're like, well, I don't know, yeah, don't do any, you know, you get Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I'm just about to move to Atlanta where I happen to know the second sentence out of everyone's mouth is, you know, after they say, hi, 
hey, where are you from? And then they say, what church do you go to? It's the second thing. So it's going to be fascinating. <laughs> yes, sir. In Mercer's uh, article about application of Colbert, how practical was he making it? Because yeah, I I've taught it for many years. So how does he, for parents, help them to understand how they can use it for yeah. their children? Um, it's a she. Uh, Jean Mercer is a she. Um, she. One of the things I, I should also say is I have leapt on the Kohlberg model that she has in that article, and she actually is, has asked me to downplay that because she's more excited about theory of mind, which she also presents. Um, uh, but Kohlberg is one of those things that can help crystallize um, morality and help people understand it. So I think that's the limit to what she really does with it. She says... Uh, um, that we all move through stages of our moral understanding, and that the one of the, one of the first uh, stages is, and this is interesting, I, I kind of reversed these, but Kohlberg um, uh, apparently puts fear of punishment ahead of uh, desire for reward in the, the moral development. So the first thing a child does, you, you ask a, a two-year-old, um, now why was it wrong to steal that, uh, that candy or whatever, and, and he'll say, because you get in trouble, you know? That's why it's wrong. Uh, and then there's, uh, we move into sort of a punishment and reward model, and then you know, continue further on a law and order model. Uh, you know, the, those are the rules. What's the matter with the Ten Commandments? Uh, but I think that's primarily what she's doing is opening up a space to think of morality in a different way and to say that uh, different people um, sometimes end up cycling in one moral uh, stage and haven't really gotten to the point like, you know, for example, you take somebody like Martin Luther King, there is a sixth stage uh, statement, or Gandhi, somebody who is opposing uh, the popular consensus and doing it anyway because it's the right thing. That's a really high level of moral uh, development. The Sisters of St. Joseph, um, I know, who go down and protest at the School of the Americas in, in uh, Georgia and get arrested, that's sixth level moral development. That's the sort of thing we should be applauding, not somebody who does what's right because they're going to be rewarded or punished or because it's the law, it's the rule. You know, there's the highest level is breaking laws that need to be broken. And that's, a, that's a, a thing. I remember I drove through a protest against the Iraq war with my boy when he was about seven years old. And there were sirens going. They were starting to round people up. We were just driving through this North Carolina town, uh, city. And uh, I was there with my boy and my wife's great uncle, who's a Baptist minister, incidentally. And Connor said, what's going on? And I said, these people think that the war is wrong, and uh, so they're out here blocking the streets, and they're getting arrested for that. I said, Whoa. So we started talking about it, and I said, it's a really courageous thing to do. I said, they should be arrested. They really should. But that's what they want. They want to confront it and take the punishment to draw attention to it. That's the thing. And the <laughs> minister was just sitting there vibrating with the idea that, that I could even have a conversation with my son about breaking the, the rule being the right thing. You know, and then he started to be a little excited when I said they should be arrested. And then, you know, I, just watching him flip back and forth made it clear that he was in a law and order state of mind. And here I was trying to bring my son to a sixth level understanding. Um, so that's what Gene Mercer does, I think, just sort of open all those possibilities up. Yeah. Uh, you, you taught critical thinking in college? Yeah, 11 years. Uh, Oh, I, no, I think it's, uh, I, I don't, I would never put it beyond any uh, individual's ability. I would say that we, uh, throughout our lives, uh, very frequently tend to put uh, obstacles in the way. Um, if you um, learn early on that doubt is bad, there's not a single worse impediment to critical thinking, not a single one. Can you imagine the idea that questioning something is ever bad. You know, I, this is what Stu's talking about, you know, telling his daughter to question his authority. Um, that doesn't mean that he thinks his authority is worthless or that he's wrong, but that the value is, is in that. So I do think it's inherent, but I do also think that people can get themselves in situations and have early experiences that cause it to be extraordinarily difficult. What do you think? Sure. Uh, it could be taught to, like, grade schoolers? Or... Oh, no question. No question. I... I, I started teaching it as soon as my kids could talk, because um, one of the things that I think is really important is to, um, and then Stu's going to address this too, 
um, is to not make critical thinking a uh, an academic thing. Not make it something. Oh, I know it's it's. <laughs> Stu's gonna. Stu is working on uh, on a book proposal right now for uh, uh, um, on that idea. I'll let him speak to that in a minute. But it it is integrate. It is in every school district I've ever seen. It's in their standards. It's in state standards. It's in federal standards. It's all over the place and it's barely touched in any in any real way so there need to be more materials made but um, we also need to approach it as an everyday thing that's something that everyday folks can do because they can you recognize a, a few very simple principles in critical thinking and then you're doing it you know you're you're uh, it, I say that critical thinking is about trying to get it right you know it's the effort that's the the key thing I will be delighted to, to get to that one. Uh, Stu's going to uh, address the other one first. Yeah, just wanted to add, I, I agree with Dale's comment that, that we have the capacity for critical thinking. I think people's beliefs um, can become so immersed, or they become so immersed in their belief that, that their reality is so much different than maybe I could even comprehend. And so to, to really ask those difficult questions become psychologically painful. And, and if you think about, you know, take someone who is a minister, for example. What might they have to give up if they really ask those questions, really address them? Well, they've got all these people that, this flock that, that looks to them as a figure of authority. They've got friends, family, their entire social circle, people they know, their entire identity would have to change. That's a lot to ask, and I think our, our brain resists that. And Dale, I'll let you take the next question. Uh, yeah, about the Catholic College. Um, it was it was uh, increasingly painful as time went on, uh, because I was getting very excited about critical thinking. I was hired in the, into the music department and uh, then went into the critical thinking course after a few years, and just never looked back. I was so elated to be teaching that. It was it was uh, uh, it kept me in teaching much longer. Um, the thing that really outraged me about Catholic uh, intellectual tradition, as they call it, um, in particular, is how baldly hypocritical it is. Um, I actually have a much greater respect for Bob Jones University or Jerry Falwell because they don't even pretend that reason has any value. You know, so they're. <laughs> but to say for the Catholic Church to say in the way, and for this college to say in the way it did in every one of its public statements, critical thinking is one of the highest values. And um, then the next sentence would typically be in, in a speech by the president or something like that. Um, but we are confident that critical thinking leads to Catholic conclusions. You know, it's that, that sort of a thing. Okay, it's okay to be confident, but then they take action if it turns out that the critical inquiry doesn't appear to be leading in Catholic directions. Uh, absolutely outrageous. And so what I started doing, um, just in a very quick synopsis, is uh, some students came to me and wanted to start a humanist group on campus, which we eventually built up to 26 members, including faculty members and the dean's secretary, and uh, it was really terrific. And then we got some money from the Institute for Humanist Studies and invited Dan Barker and Annie Laurie Gaylor to come on campus and, and give a talk about feminism and free thought. This is a women's college. Um, it was never mentioned at St. Kate's that the majority of uh, the great figures in feminism for the last 200 years have been atheists and agnostics, uh, never mentioned. So Annie Laurie was going to give a wonderful scholarly presentation on this, and 30 minutes before they were due to start, the president sent a security guard over and locked the door. Um, so I stayed for two more years um, and basically tried to get the school to take critical thinking more seriously and to realize what a completely outrageous and stupid act that was. And uh, then I eventually um, couldn't do it. So eventually it became, uh, I used to pull into my parking space and sit for five or ten minutes and not be able to go into the building. I'm not kidding. It just so turned my stomach to, to be there and I'm just so thrilled <laughs> to be out. Yeah. Um, statistically speaking, with such a high percentage of people that are locked away in the Matrix, those people that are familiar with the movie The Matrix must see it because oh, yeah. it's all about freedom of consciousness and yeah. being a free entity. Um, <clears throat> how 
you keep your sanity in situations where you're confronted with the oppressive reactionary forces that are in this world? Yeah. Um, you want to start with that one and then I'll... I don't claim to have kept my sanity. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I guess for me, it's just you know, I, I view the world in a in a in a way that's different from many other people, uh, and and I do kind of relate to that to that matrix metaphor. Uh, it just seems to me that, that so many people um, have, you know, been indoctrinated, been programmed into what looks to me like a cult, and. and uh, that that's that's where their minds have gone, and and um, they live in their world. I live in mine, and uh, I don't know, Dale. Yeah, and I'd uh, uh, the problem, of course, is when the worlds collide, <laughs> as as they sometimes do. And um, but what my posture has become, I feel incredibly fortunate to have been able to make it out. I actually understand why people are religious. I, I get it. It's it's um, they haven't been permitted. To get out. There are structures built around religious people to reinforce that, to tell them that doubting is bad, to tell them that even beginning to, I mean, that's the thing, they get it right at the threshold, you know? They're in, trying to get in there, which is grotesque. Um, so I actually, you know, they don't have, if somebody doesn't have the education, if they don't have the uh, uh, stability in other ways, you know, other relationships that can make them feel whole, if they're in a desperate situation economically or physically or something like that, I understand. I can get turning to, you know, a father figure in that way. So that's kind of the way I, I handle it. Is that I really try to develop an empathy for it, and at the same time, I will not accept the consequences, the more poisonous consequences of it. So I'm, uh, and that's a change for me. I think um, five, six years ago, I was really trying to envision a world without it, and now I'm saying, you know what? It, it, it's always going to be here. Can we break its monopoly, and can we get people talking? Uh, just get a cultural value that there are no ideas that we shouldn't be able to discuss. Get rid of the idea of uh, the sacred, essentially, in terms of, and I don't mean that get rid of all meaning, I mean get rid of the idea that there's something that cannot be discussed. That's, that's another idea I won't, uh, won't accept. Yeah, sure. One other thing that's helped me is just approaching it from a sense of curiosity and being just deeply curious of how people can believe something to me that is so absurd, um, trying to understand the human mind and so forth. So that's, for me, that's yeah. just a, a fascinating area of study. Yeah, this worked for my son, actually, that exact one. Um, glad you mentioned that. Uh, we were in his, uh, his grandma's Episcopal service on Christmas Eve, and he's going, oh, God, he's <laughs> so bored. And um, I leaned over to him, and I said, um, what would it be like if you were able to go back in time and be at a temple ritual for uh, Zeus? You know, some sort of a, serve, a worship service for Zeus. It's just lit up. Oh, that would be so cool. You know, you could just watch these people doing these, these unusual things. That would be so great. And I said, just imagine you're doing the same thing. Imagine you're from the future and you've come back and you're watching these people do this worship. And he was riveted for the rest of the time. <laughs> So I do think that's a good that's a good approach. Yes. Yes. Yeah, theologians do use critical thinking. They absolutely do. But they depart from unsecured assumptions. This is the thing that I finally, I finally got this sorted out because I went into long discourses with theologians at St. Kate's trying to figure it out. These incredibly intelligent people, incredibly gifted and good people who were talking nonsense, but they were talking it in big words. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong until I realized that what they've done is accepted certain things, you know, God is real, Jesus, you know, actually they don't all go with the Jesus is divine thing, but basically they've accepted the basic theological principles, and then they say, since we know these things are true, and then they think critically um, on the basis of those. 
Um, what I'm doing, what we're doing, is trying to say, let's go ahead and ch challenge even those foundational assumptions. This is what the president said when she called me into her office after the, the, the event. Uh, she said, I, I, well, I said to her, I really want the students to be able to think critically about everything, even about the existence of God. And she said, the existence of God, that's pretty fundamental, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, why is it that we can't think about fundamental questions, you know? <laughs> this is a college. So I, the answer to the question, I think, is that they do do critical thinking, but they depart from unsecured assumptions that make me queasy. But isn't that part of critical thinking? Sure it is. That's part of being complete. This is the thing. I should say that it's a, a, an amazing facsimile of critical thinking. That's the thing. It looks just like it because they are critically examining things, and you're saying, well, what, why is it such nonsense then? Oh, it's because they're built on air. You know, the, the actual foundation is, is unsecured. So it's, it's bad critical thinking, but it actually uh, looks just like the same, the same thing. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. With the critical thinking itself? Oh, yeah. They don't say that, though. Catholic theologians don't believe the Bible is inerrant. Uh, their parishioners do. Um, but the, th the other thing about the Catholic Church, oh, I could go forever. It, it's split. It's two churches. It's two churches. The theologians have an utterly unrelated, utterly unrelated view of the, wor the universe. It's, it's, it's absolutely central to their statements. It is, they say, oh, they are so proud of their intellectual tradition and so proud that critical thinking supports Catholicism. This is what they will say in, at every turn. And I was trying to say, well, does it? Let's hear another voice. And they locked the door. Um, it's outrageous. And while I was there, I had to sort of pretend, well, I really disagree with that, you know. I wish they hadn't done that. Now I'm out and I can say, it was outrageous. It was absolutely uh, um, <laughs> outrageous. You couldn't convince them then, being there as a professor? No, and I didn't even want to convince them. I wanted students who were interested in asking questions to be able to ask questions and to hear other voices. That's all. So. And I'm always a why child. It was never enough because the Bible said so. Never enough because my father said so. Right. Yeah. That it has been given to them, and they've always been that way. Yeah, I, I think biological questions, I used to reject them utterly. When I was a psych major initially in, in college, I was very much an environmental social model kind of, kind of guy. And I hated the idea that people were you know, born with certain predispositions. And then I had children. <laughs> and boy, they come out. It's amazing. Yeah, it is educational. <laughs> Uh, they seem to come out um, not only with predispositions, but so wildly different from each other that I'm much more open to that idea that there are biological predispositions and two, uh, you know, response to authority and all that, entirely possible. I don't know. Do you have, what do you think about that? Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. There's, I think that whole plays into the whole nature-nurture debate. There's a great book on that by Steven Pinker called The Blank Slate. Um, it talks about that, but, but certainly I think that's just a personality characteristic. It's not a guarantee, but it makes you more prone to probably reject religion, and I was rebellious as well. Okay, you guys both go. Okay. Um, you two have the last comment. Sure. To say in response to what she said, yeah. my mother grew up in a household where her father was an atheist. And I don't think her mother was particularly, she was more just interested in everything. Right. She just kind of checked a lot of things out. Um, but my mother snuck out to go to church, okay? She wanted to go to church. Family wouldn't have let her go if they'd known, but yeah. she went to, to friends and they went to church. And so all my life she went to churches. Now she always just found whoever was actually active nice. Mm -hmm. church. She didn't care what brand it was. Right, yeah. And so I grew up in a household where she went to church and dad kept his mouth shut because he grew up in a household 
where they were Christian scientists and they were very strict. Mm -hmm. And he didn't actually come out and mention he was atheist until after I became part of the organization. So the mm -hmm. irony there is that he grew up in this rigidly religious group and became an atheist. And my mother grew up in this atheist household and became religious. Yeah. And I think that there are people with a predisposition to believe. Right, and I also think that there is a predisposition of kids to rebel. And that if, if there is somebody with that predisposition uh, or who runs into it, I mean, it's a, par a, a normal and good part of growing up. They have to pull away from us. And this is one of the reasons that I say religious exposure is so important. I, I will never tell my kids they can't go to church. If they show the slightest inkling, take them to church, take them to the church of their choice uh, and get, giving them a lot of exposure so that we don't hopefully run into it for that reason. Because that's not their own choice either in a way. It's just a rebellion. So. Yeah. It's still that way for her now. Okay, yeah, so it might just be a predisposition, sure. Interesting, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. My thought was in terms, thank you for bringing up the Pinkers. Having spent 40 years in education, public education isn't any different than Catholic education in the sense of assumption. We teach critical thinking, but we don't teach people to question authority. In fact, you go to most classrooms and you question the authority which happens to be the God in front of the room. Yeah. And you're shot down by that teacher. Yeah. You don't question me. Right. Well, we need to revise education fundamentally. Yeah. Because, but it, yes, and, and of course we go to the same assumptions in the sense that the Catholics have, as a former Catholic, you know, <laughs> that, that there are assumptions you don't even right. think of questioning. God exists. And then you build from there. Yeah. That is never a question. Yeah, yeah, I think you're singing to the choir. The, uh, yes, the, uh, and I think a big challenge with that is for teachers is having kids go home asking uncomfortable questions and then having to deal with the parents. But uh, yes, a huge <laughs> issue that needs to be fixed. So. Yeah, that's true. Okay, well, thank you very much.